In my video Holes Scotland Salmon Scandal, I far too quickly skimmed through the detrimental impact of dissolved waste emanating from salmon farms. For the alarming quantities, I referred to Malcolm McGarvin's paper Scotland's Secret, published by the World Wildlife Fund in 2000, in which he estimated, based on data of course, not guesswork, that Scotland's fish farms created sewage and solution equivalent to more than that produced by the entire population of Scotland. We assiduously treat our human sewage to remove pollutants. Fish farmers don't. At all. And now, in 2021, they're releasing significantly more than 20 years ago, shamelessly. I also quoted a passage from a research paper by Joanne Burkholder and colleagues, which unambiguously states that Chronic exposure to nitrate-enriched waters is directly lethal to the seagrass Zostoma marina, even at low enrichment levels. This seagrass, aka eelgrass, a marine flowering plant which isn't a grass in the sense we usually mean, is a sensitive indicator of habitat quality. Its decline in Scotland and disappearance from some shores symptomise ecological deterioration, but because of its rarity and unfamiliarity, its gradual demise repeatedly goes unnoticed until it's too late. Professor Burkholder doesn't pull her punch when pressing home the stark fact that even slight enrichment, particularly of nitrates and ammonia, is not just potentially harmful, but directly lethal to seagrass. Since the dissolved waste from salmon farms is rich in nitrates and ammonia, it seems reasonable to conclude that there is a link between low-level pollution from that source and seagrass potential or actual extinctions. Although we are unable to detect the cause without chemical monitoring, usually beyond the capability of the public, once the biology has been explained, the circumstantial evidence becomes very persuasive. Let's examine it. The common eelgrass, which these days is far from common in the UK, is a flowering plant that grows on beaches beneath the waves from and beyond the low water mark. It is conspicuous by its presence only on shores where pollution is minimal and therefore its absence from many British shores. As Burkholder and Sebrion and Egan and Fredrickson and Hawkswell and others have all observed, one major cause of seagrass losses is eutrophication. That causes encrusting organisms to colonise the surface of seagrass leaves above, reducing their capacity for photosynthesis. First, I'd better explain eutrophication. I like to call eutrophication ecological obesity. Increased concentrations of dissolved nutrients can cause changes in the community structure of marine organisms, usually with the greediest organisms being favoured at the expense of biodiversity. The best known occurrences of ecological responses to eutrophication are algal blooms and ponds and rivers stifled by blanket weed. Water bodies with a low nutrient status are known as oligotrophic, literally few feeding. Slightly richer water bodies are known as mesotrophic, middle feeding. What concerns us and the seagrass are the overfed water bodies we call eutrophic, good feeding. Unfortunately in modern times, because of widespread pollution, this is the common form, sometimes greater, sometimes lesser. Scottish sea lochs are naturally mesotrophic but can become eutrophic when influenced by, for instance, fertiliser runoff from agricultural land. The ecological impact we recognise is the increasing occurrence of algal blooms. They proliferate due to the fertiliser effect of the modified water and use up dissolved oxygen relied upon by the resident organisms. So eutrophication is best avoided, no, sorry, prevented. Here's a small oligotrophic lake on the Isle of Skye, Loch Nanilan, with the Kulin range in the background. If the water were to be analysed, concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus compounds would be low, while a species count would find biodiversity to be pretty healthy. Here I've photoshopped in an algal bloom, photographed in a smelly pool elsewhere, to show what happens if dissolved nutrient levels are caused to increase. Many of the resident organisms, for instance the water lily and the bog bean, would be either unable to function, that is, poisoned or suffocated, or simply outcompeted by the blanket weed for light or room to grow. So what role do salmon farms play in eutrophication? 
Since a single salmon farm with 12 120 metre cages produces approximately 1,000 tonnes of faecal waste every year and equally alarming quantities of the dissolved nutrients that can cause eutrophication, nitrates, ammonia and phosphates, we might reasonably speculate that the nutrient concentrations in seawater will increase. Whether the water has the capacity to prevent eutrophication depends on the site. Here in Loch Carron, there will be a degree of tidal flushing, but I suggest it would not be enough to prevent the potential for eutrophication, particularly since the Scottish Salmon Company installed at yet another 16 cages adjacent to these 12, and, for goodness sake, right up against a marine protected area with fantastic biodiversity. One despairs of the Highland Council's planning process. I'm afraid they just don't know what they're doing. Anyhow, all locations are different, but there are lots of fish farms, enough of them to produce together waste equivalent to the sewage of Scotland. I think we may fairly conclude that that could well have significant ecological impacts, that they will probably be detrimental and they will be affecting the entire west coast of Scotland. Next, we consider the impacts of eutrophication on seagrass, which would not be as dramatic as that simulation and could well go unnoticed if it weren't for a few ecologists like Joanne Burkholder and others, and of course those at Project Seagrass. Here's a colony of seagrass, specifically common eelgrass, growing in a bay of Loch Eshort on the Isle of Skye. The only land farms by its shores are non-intensive and Loch Eshort has no salmon farms. Neither have two adjacent lochs, Loch Slapin and Loch Skaveg, so the water should be reasonably clean, hopefully more or less mesotrophic. Let's reserve judgement on that because the seagrass might tell a different story. When the tide goes out, the seagrass remains underwater, except during low spring tides, as here, when it spends a short while lying exposed and flat. Of course, when the tide's in, it stands up and waves about with the current. Seagrass colonies tend to be known as meadows, and this is one of Loch Eshort's most extensive and accessible. The biodiversity on these shores is extraordinary and staggers even the most seasoned of biologists. We have found 11 crab species on these beaches. That's seven or eight more than anybody might have expected. This place is remarkable. In clean mesotrophic seawater, the leaves spend most of their time with a clean surface, free of encrusting growths of other organisms. Here, a tiny one centimetre giant scallop has taken up residence, firmly attached to a leaf by byssus threads until it's ready to take up its free swimming adult lifestyle. Earlier in the year, the leaves were clear of growths, as in the previous picture, but now in September they are severely encrusted, in this instance I think, but I'm not certain, with colonial sea squirts, here shown in close-up. If anybody can provide a confident identification, please let me know. Here, relatively clean leaves have become colonised by the minute stalked polyps of a colonial hydrozoan species, possibly Clytia hemispherica, but please don't hold me to that. Again, if you can tell what it is, let me know. In this instance, it's a filamentous red alga, a seaweed that's taken up residence on the seagrass leaves. Seagrass faces several problems that result from eutrophication. One, turbidity of the water column that reduces sunlight passing through it. Two, increased growth of epiphytic organisms, that's organisms which, as we've seen, grow on the leaves. And three, sediments accumulating on leaf surfaces. The problem for the seagrass is that if the water in which it lives is cloudy or its surface is coated with anything, sunlight is filtered out and photosynthesis, the chemical process by which the plant manufactures its carbohydrate, its food, is inhibited. The thicker and more opaque the light inhibitor, the worse it is for the seagrass. In detail, the various wavelengths of sunlight penetrate the water to different degrees. Red light penetrates least efficiently. Being green, the seagrass is dependent upon the complementary red light for photosynthesis, so it can operate only in the shallows, to an absolute maximum depth of about 4 metres in clear water. Water turbidity will limit the depth at which the seagrass can grow, so if dissolved nutrients increase plankton and water becomes cloudy, that's not good for seagrass. But the greater problem is the amount of shading caused by organisms growing on the seagrass leaves. 
Researchers have shown that as concentrations of dissolved nitrate and ammonium compounds increase, so does the growth of epiphytes. Seagrass growing in deeper water, already limited by reduced sunlight penetration, becomes further compromised by epiphyte growths, eventually dying back while the colony persists in the shallower water. As the eutrophication gradually increases, the colony margin contracts farther and farther up the shore as only the plants in shallower water are able to survive. As you can probably imagine, eventually the colony will die and become locally extinct. If sources of pollutants persist and increase, eutrophication will become increasingly severe and, as has been recognised, seagrass beds become rarer and rarer. There are several reasons why that is problematic. 1. Seagrass meadows are an important nursery for numerous creatures, including commercially important fishes, cod for one, and mollusks, as we've seen, scallops. 2. Seagrass is home to its own unique biodiversity, which, if lost, well, we've all heard David Attenborough talking about biodiversity losses. 3. In common with so many other natural communities, seagrass meadows constitute a carbon sink we can't afford to lose. Whichever way you look at it, seagrass matters to what us. What should we, we make of the epiphyte growth found in September 2014 and other years on the seagrass in Loch Eshort? Is this normal for late season, or are we witnessing eutrophication from a non-local source in what otherwise seems to be a pristine loch system? Are the Loch Eshort seagrass meadows imperceptibly contracting, with a long-term possibility of extinction? Only a disciplined scientific investigation would answer such questions, but the circumstantial evidence from first-hand observation should give us cause for concern. We now have a small group of local people investigating the biology of Loch Eshort, the South Sky Seas Initiative, or Triple SI, using boats and a remotely operated underwater vehicle with cameras, and they have discovered many more seagrass meadows than were previously known about. Therefore, we now have good distribution data, but experimental ecological investigations can be, at present, no more than a pipe dream. With a bit of luck, this video will help persuade viewers that answers to the questions it raises should be sought before the seagrass quietly disappears from here as it has done elsewhere. This presentation has been an extended re-evaluation of a section in my main YouTube video on the Oxtatire Academy channel, which covers a diversity of biological, musical and other topics. So please visit, you might find something there that interests you. Other people have.